Would you all just take a big deep breath and exhale? And remember that as we start worship, we enter the throne room. I just, I love to start worship that way with that reminder and that if you take a moment, your personal imagery that the Lord is waiting for us, he rejoices, he's excited that he gets to spend time with us like this. He covets that time. He's waiting for you. He's waiting to hear your thoughts and your prayers. He's waiting for your worship. He's waiting for your learning, your seeking into scripture. All of that delights him. You are the delight of his heart. Would you please stand? Father God, we love to understand and to realize that we individually are the delight of your heart, that our name is on your lips and our name makes you smile. Lord, it doesn't matter what we've done in our past. It doesn't matter the mistakes we've made. What matters is that we're here and that we're earnestly seeking your presence and that we enter into this season of preparation with worship. Be with us now, in Jesus' name, amen.
Shall be 
stone was moved for good, for the Lamb has conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe, for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, and the Spirit lit the flame. This gospel truth the world shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Hear God's promise of hope from Jeremiah 33:14 through 16. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will, will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. Today is special because it is the beginning of a new season. We call this season Advent. Advent is a word that means to come. It is a time when we get ready, prepare ourselves for the coming of Jesus Christ. And Jesus came when he was born on Christmas Day. What we are doing right now by lighting the first candle of the first Sunday of Advent is a way of preparing for Christmas. And today we light the, pur the one purple candle. 
The traditional color for Advent is purple, which refers to the coming of the royal king, Jesus Christ. Purple is also the deep color that symbolizes spiritual darkness outside the light of Christ. This first candle is the candle of hope. Now, if you follow me along in the prayer in the bulletin, it says, God of hope, we seek you during this holy season of Advent. Help us to see who you in all whom we encounter. May your hope fill our hearts so that we might reflect your hope for all the world. Amen. We get to do something very special. I mean, it's, it's, um, I'm not making light of it when I say this is kind of the reason why we do what we do, right? Um, I'm very excited to let you know that Evie has decided and asked to be baptized this morning. So we're gonna have that service for her this morning. It's fitting that we do this during Christmas, celebrating and preparing our hearts for Christ with the altar so beautiful just as beautiful as she is, and her heart, who's ready to be a member of the family of Christ, right? So you want to come on up here with me? Just stand here with me for a second. Baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is through this grace that we share in his righteousness and become heirs of life eternal. By receiving the sacrament, we're marked as a Christian disciple, welcomed into Christ's holy church, accepted as a citizen of the kingdom of God and a daughter of almighty God. Will you pray with me, please? Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow when you saw your people as slaves in Egypt. You led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised them. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. It is in your name that we follow your example this morning. Amen. Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 11 says, What do we say? Do we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How do we who have died to sin live in it any longer? Or do you know that as many of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we are slaves to sin no more. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that Christ died, he died to sin once and for all. And the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise us also. Reckon ourselves to be dead indeed to sin through the water of baptism and alive to God 
in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of God. So Evie, I have a question for you. A couple questions, actually. And I love it that you are up here because you're at the age to understand this isn't something that other adults can do for you. It's a decision that you make on your own and that you stand before all your friends and people who, look at all those faces. They love you. All these people are family for you. And so it's your choice and your personal acceptance before God as his daughter that you make today, okay? So let me ask you a couple questions. Do you promise to do everything you can to live according to what God expects from you and to remember that he created you and he loves you and he's got so much for you. And when bad things happen or the enemy tries to poke his head at you, you're going to say, no, 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 no. (laughs) Talk to the hand because I know the truth. Can you do that? Yeah. Okay. Can you do to the absolute best of your ability to find wherever you're at in this world, at whatever age you are, find a family church that's going to love you and help you grow and be a disciple? Do you profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior and believe in him that he died for you? That all of your mistakes in the past, he's taken a giant eraser and erased them all. You get a fresh start. You get a big do-over. And Jesus loves you and he's part of your family. Do you believe that? Amen. I warmed it up so it's not freezing cold. How's that? (laughs) All right. Evie, I love you. God loves you too. And it is with the power that he has given me as your pastor and the pastor of this church that I baptize you. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and then in the name of Holy Spirit, you are dead to sin and alive in Christ. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Would you come up? Have you pray over her? Jesse, bring that baby up here. Stevie, you want to come too? Yes. Oh yeah, got to have the whole family. They thought they could get out of it. That's right. Not going to happen. You want to stand behind me here? I'm going to have you all just lay a hand on her. Okay. And let's pray. Father God, this beautiful young woman is your daughter. Lord, you have so many things to teach her, so many things that are just amazing in this world to show her. Scripture says that she is your masterpiece. She was created by your hand to do good things. And you have identified those good things way before she was even born. Father, I call those forth all to everybody whose lives she's going to touch, to the difference she's going to make in this world. I say yes and amen. Amen. Thank you. Our first passage from scripture today comes from Luke chapter 3, verses 2 through 6. During the high priesthood of Ananias and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance and for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out to the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. 
Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth. And all the flesh shall see the salvation of God. And our second passage is from the book of Isaiah. Excuse me. Chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you, will also give you, let's see. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. Amen. Thank you. It's all right. I got it. We're out of sync. <laughs> Lots going on today. Isn't that wonderful? I'm dropping things too. You know, when we were singing that song this morning, um, it talked about how Jesus left heaven and ran to us. And it made me think of, you guys know missionaries, right? I mean, we have, the Diedrichs have them in their family how many times have you thought to yourself, I bless those missionaries because man, I could never do that. <laughs> Give up everything you own to live in typically a third world country that doesn't have the amenities that we have and to really make that massive sacrifice to spread the gospel. And I think sometimes we underestimate what Jesus did for us in coming to earth. And that imagery went through my head. Man, it's probably kind of like that. Because he was in heaven. He was seated at the right hand of the Father. He literally had everything. And the moment he saw our need, he left it all behind to come live in the mess that we've made down here to offer us a way of redemption. I don't know. It just made that song a little more powerful for me when we were singing it to understand and to put in a little bit of a different perspective what Christmas is all about and what Jesus actually did. So we officially have 28 days of shopping left till Christmas. <laughs> Anybody else a little freaked out by that? You can shop anytime, day or night, don't worry. <laughs> Although we in here support locally owned businesses, I did find a piece of data that said that there's going to be, they estimate that UPS will ship somewhere around 800 million packages this holiday season. Holy cow. They do the work and all we have to do is click and then pay the bill in January, right? <laughs> If you have friends or family who enjoy waiting for packages, there's some different gift options I found online. There's actually a website um, called, what is it? Amazingclubs.com. And there's something around 50 different clubs that you can join. You know the typical ones, like the dessert of the month club, the wine club, the you know cookie club. Well, there's also a bacon of the month club. So if anyone likes bacon, you can get a f different kind of bacon shipped to your home every month for about 50 bucks a month. You, there's a pickle of the month club. There's also a peanut butter and jelly of the month club. I don't know about you, but that'd be pretty cool, seeing what gourmet PB&J was delivered to my home every month. <laughs> Another so funny story that kind of relates to this season is, in the, does the name Charles McKinley ring any bells to anybody? So back in 2003, Charles McKinley wanted to go visit his parents for Christmas, but didn't want to pay for the ticket to fly there. He was going from New York to, California, uh, to Dallas. And so what he did is he packed himself some extra clothes and some computer stuff in a shipping crate and literally mailed himself through a major airline to Dallas. And do you know that he made it through two airplane changes, cargo planes, the delivery driver actually took the box to the home and was delivering it to the home when he could peek between the slats of the crate so that this Charles McKinley could get air and saw that there was an actual person in there. 
and called the police and he was arrested. Almost made it. I wouldn't recommend shipping yourself anywhere. <laughs> but it is kind of funny that he made it that far, isn't it? <laughs> Jan, no ideas. <laughs> Christmas is a time of waiting and expectation. It's a time of preparation. And I'm going to talk about how we look to the prophets today to kind of share a little bit about what their experience was waiting for Jesus and the expectation. But when you think about it, the majority of our lives is spent waiting for something, is it not? Waiting and preparing. And preparing is a lot of work. Think about your Thanksgiving dinner. How much time did you spend preparing? Unless you went out to eat, maybe you're one of those, that's totally fine, I'm becoming more one of those myself every year. But think about how much time, if you did cook and prepare the meal at home, and then how much time did it take to consume it? Yeah, I, <laughs> 17 minutes. I kinda, I, weddings are a little bit like that too. You spend months and months and months and months to prepare, and then it's almost, it's almost anticlimactic because you're up there for 20, I, 20 minutes. Unless you're a Catholic like I was, and it, you know, you're there for the hour long service. It's just, I don't know. There's something about the preparing, and when you think about how much time we w spend, I'm not gonna say waste, <laughs> how much time we spend in the preparations and in the expectations of what is to come, I kind of think that maybe it's the preparing that's the point. Think about that for a minute. In some ways, the preparing is the doing. <laughs> I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that our short time on earth is more about preparing for eternity in heaven than what we accomplish or do on this earth. In fact, the best use of our time is probably to prepare our hearts to becoming more like Jesus and to help other people get prepared to meet him someday. The primary point of the, old, the entire Old Testament, there's a fancy word, I'll break it down, it's called Prote, protevangelium, okay? Protevangelium. Protos is the Greek word for first, and evangelium is where we get the word evangelist. It means good news. So the very first good news, any idea where that came in Scripture? We know that there was a lot prophesied about Jesus, but it may surprise you to know that the very first, the protangelium, the very first notice that good news was coming was in Genesis chapter three, verse 15. Immediately after the fall, God already had a plan in place for restoration. Directly after Adam and Eve sinned, God said, and I will put enmity between you, he's speaking to the serpent, the deceiver. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Who's he talking about? Jesus. Jesus. The work of the serpent that it was expressed through Adam and Eve Adam and Eve's conscious choice to sin would one day be crushed by her offspring. That offspring, of course, points to Jesus. I think that's pretty cool. Jesus fulfilled not just 48 specific Messiah, Messianic predictions in the Old Testament, but there were 324 total individual prophecies that related to the Messiah. And Genesis 3.15 was the first one. Micah chapter five, verse two, you know this one, but you, Bethlehem Ephrath, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. <laughs> Micah also wrote about a um, hundred different names in the Bible for Jesus. He's called, we sang them today, he's called the Alpha and the Omega, the Word of Life, the Bright Morning Star, the Light of the World, I Am, the Ancient of Days, Jesus, Emmanuel, meaning God with us. 
And yet when Jesus arrived, he came in a very small, humble beginning in a forgotten town that didn't even have the proper room for his arrival. But let's not allow the circumstances he chose to confuse us on exactly who this child is. He is the ancient one, the creator, the author and giver of life, the word of God. For hundreds of years, the Israelites and the prophets looked to him and waited for his rescue. And even in the New Testament, Jesus gives lots of, king, of parables talking about the kingdom and about preparation and about being prepared because we, again, can relate to the prophets in the Old Testament better than anybody because we, again, are waiting for his second coming, for his return. We are in a season of waiting. And so I think that this waiting is the point. <laughs> I think that this waiting, it's, it, Christmas is about so much more, and you know this, you've heard this a thousand times, and I think we've heard it so many times, it doesn't sink in. It's about more than the gifts and the decorations, and all of that is magnificent and wonderful and beautiful, and lends to the season, and how, how we decorate and, and prepare in beauty <laughs> for the celebration. But the most important preparation piece of all, do not miss it and do not overlook it. And it is your per personal preparation for the coming of Jesus Christ. The preparation that takes place in your heart, that is sacred ground. Just like the prophets of old, we know that Jesus is coming again. We don't know when. We prepare our hearts to receive and grow in him now and anticipate the day when we will get to meet him face to face. And I love that on Christmas, we celebrate and remember the birth of Jesus, but we can't forget that he's already come once. He is coming again. And we wait expectantly and we prepare for that coming. Preparation begins with repentance. And so I want to talk a little bit about repentance as you go into Advent. <laughs> John the Baptist was the last prophet who had to wait for Jesus' first arrival. He tells us in Matthew 3, 2, 3, verse 2, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. He says in verse 8, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Verse 11, he says, I baptize you with water for repentance. Repentance simply means to turn. So listen, John is not saying y'all better start feeling really guilty for all the things that you've done. <laughs> He's not saying that. He's not saying, I want you to feel really bad. <laughs> Repentance might begin with a prick in your heart that calls to mind something that you need to repent from, but don't let it stay there. It's not meant to stay there. It's meant to capture your attention so that you can do something about it, which is to turn from it. <laughs> so what's our approach to Christmas gonna be this year? What's that gonna look like? Is it gonna be like all the rest? Fast and harried, stressful, overwhelming, expensive, crazy, trying to outdo each other or prove a point to people? Or are we going to take our cue from the prophets? Waiting and preparing for his arrival. Will you have the courage to do the deep work of preparing your heart? <laughs> Will we allow this season to be one of reflection, of adoration and repentance? Psalm 51 says, a broken and contrite heart, God, you will not despise. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't let this Christmas come and go. Don't miss it. The prophets of old missed it. The religious leaders during Jesus' time, the scribes and the Pharisees missed it. They were very focused on sin, right? Because they made a living out of all of the rules and the regulations <laughs> that you had to follow to, to get right with God, right? But what they missed 
was their own personal sense of repentance, the own personal need to repent and to turn back to God and to understand that what he calls us to is individual. It's not about matching a set of rules or following or this or doing this right. It's not about that at all. It's about understanding our own personal need. They ignored that because they could follow the rules but they miss the personal transformation that Jesus offers us individually. They were looking for a ruler that would come in and free them from Roman rule. Don't miss that. <laughs> what we're missing, what we're needing is the repentance that comes in our hearts. It's not about um, feeling guilty. I talked about that. It's not about... Um, the stress and anxiety of the season. <laughs> it's not about the desperation to pay for everything. We should be desperate for a savior and realize that our personal need to be with him and the need for him to come and die for what we've done, right? Preparation is so important. I found an interesting set of statistics that go along with back in 2008, the Chinese were getting ready to host the Olympics and you know, maybe you don't know, the, about the mag massive preparation work that goes into preparing to host the Olympics. Massive. And I use the Chinese as an example here because in 2007, by 2007, they had built a new stadium, a new swimming center, a new shooting range, a new cycling velodrome, a new tennis center, and a new hockey stadium. They had 15,000 performers performing for opening ceremonies. 2,200 had a small part in demonstrating martial arts. That group lived and prepared together in an army camp for three months and they practiced 16 hours a day. Many of the performers were given diapers to wear during rehearsals so they didn't have to take breaks. One rehearsal lasted for 51 hours straight during a rainstorm. There's much to be said about China's human rights record, but I have to say that they got it right whenever they prepared for the opening ceremony. They had huge expectations, made tremendous preparations, and delivered. If you watched it, it was beautiful, absolutely stunning. <laughs> if we're willing to prepare to that degree for something like that, what by then same token should our preparations look like for the second coming of Jesus Christ? Have you considered how you would prepare for work or school if you expected Jesus to be there when you arrived? How would you prepare for church if you knew that God Almighty himself would show up and meet you here when, he got, when you got here? Would you spend your time getting ready in the morning if you knew the Holy Spirit was waiting to tell you something amazing as soon as you got up and were ready to listen? If you knew that you were living in the last days, would you do things differently? Would it affect your preparations? Would it affect your response, your choices, your heart before God? Because the reality is we celebrate Christmas because he has already come. <laughs> we remember his sacrifice in leaving earth. He's already come and he's coming again. He is gonna be at work in school when you get there this week. He is waiting for you to get up in the morning with something to share that is magnificent for you. He is alive and active. Perhaps knowing that Emmanuel is here with us now, was here with us yesterday, and will be here with us tomorrow, should change the way we prepare for Christmas, should change the way we prepare for work, should change the way we prepare for school, should change the way we prepare for tomorrow. Repentance. That scripture said repentance bears fruit. 
What does that fruit look like for you? Can you look at yourself in Christmas's past and see how your life has borne fruit? How have you matured and grown spiritually? How have you endeavored to step into the likeness of Christ? How have you tried to grow in your relationship with him personally? It's not about following a set of rules and regulations, about entering into a relationship. If you had a dear friend and you never spent time with them, how good could you say that relationship actually was? But like those friends who maybe you don't see for long periods of time and that moment that you get back together, you feel as if you've never been apart, that's the way it is with God if you haven't been with him in a while. Guys, there's no guilt. I don't want you walking away with that feeling. I want you walking away with hope and expectation and knowing that if you haven't spent time alone with God, if you haven't fostered that relationship and you go back to meet him, he's not gonna chastise you. He's gonna hug you. That's his nature. <laughs> He's gonna welcome you back. He's excited and he's waiting expectantly for time with you. How are we preparing for Christ's arrival? The second coming is coming also. I think sometimes, and what I don't want to have happen, you know, is know that I am big on if we do it all the time and it becomes habit to the point where it's a rote ritual and we don't start, stop, we stop thinking about the true meaning of it and we miss the true beauty of it, then I say stop doing it. <laughs> because the ritual isn't helping you. There's a meaning behind why the ritual was started and that's what we have to capture. So as we prepare ourselves for Christmas to celebrate again <laughs> the coming of Jesus Christ, I invite you to prepare yourself also and to understand and not lose track of what we are actually celebrating. How many of y'all saw the movie Captain Phillips with Tom Hanks? Anybody see that movie? I watched a glimpse of it, a, a, about four minutes of it this morning because I kind of thought about playing this clip and I was bawling by the end of it. So I'm like, nope, mm -mm, not gonna do that. I'm not gonna have y'all walking out of here on a first Sunday of Advent bawling, that's just ridiculous. So I'm gonna tell you about it. <laughs> so in the movie, Captain Phillips is, it's by the way, it's based on a true story, okay? So know that going in. Tom Hanks played Captain Phillips and he was a captain of a cargo ship that was captured by Somali pirates. And a large portion of the story was his experience with these pirates who were brutal. <laughs> Captain Phillips convinced them to let his cr crew go, so they did. So that left Captain Phillips alone. And they got into a lifeboat that wasn't, it's not like the open boat, it was more of a capsule so that it could keep them safe if they were tossed around by waves and stuff, right? So it was more of a, a capsule. And he was in this capsule with these pirates. And there was guns, and it, it was brutal. They were brutal pirates. One of the best moments in the film was the moment that Captain Phillips realizes that he's going to be saved, because they're in this and there's big portal windows in this so they can see out and it's dark. And all of a sudden the entire sky lights up with light that is just bright and intense and massive, unlike anything they'd ever seen. And what happened was the USS Bainbridge came to his rescue, found the capsule that they were hit and hit every single one of their spotlights on this capsule. I mean, it literally blinded everybody that was in this capsule. And you can see the relief and the elation on his face because he thought he was going to die. The USS Bainbridge is one of, the reality is, the USS Bainbridge, the real one, is one of 46 guided missile destroyers that the US Navy has with massive guns and missile capabilities that can destroy more than 100 targets simultaneously. 
This was the destroyer that came to his rescue. <laughs> when the Bainbridge comes to the rescue, you know the pirates are in real trouble and hope has finally arrived. I remember thinking, I don't ever wanna go up against the US Navy. <laughs> and when I watched that clip this morning, they showed the portion of um, Captain Phillips um, almost numb with fear and shock. I mean, he can barely walk. He can't speak to form a coherent thought. And so they guide him in and they guide him down to the medical unit and he's sitting there and she's checking him and she has, to, the, the, the doctor has to keep reminding him, take a deep breath for me. Take a deep breath for me. Take a deep breath for me. Are you okay? She goes, you don't look okay. Are you okay? And he can't even speak at this moment. And, and she's trying to assess his wounds and he's covered in blood. She lays him down on the mat and he starts to cry. And she looks at him and she says, it's okay, you're safe now. You're safe now. And then there's also a scene with the last pirate <laughs> sitting in a chair in an empty room surrounded by people with guns. He's shackled and in chains and he looks up and he asks about all of his other friends, <laughs> the other pirates. And this man stands in front of him and says, all of your friends are dead. You are the only one here and you are now under... Um, you are now going to the United States for, and then he says, it's over. <laughs> and the reality on the man's face, just, he just sunk <laughs> because he realized that he's, <sighs> guys, if you think about that for a minute, <laughs> you know, we get lost in this, the beauty of Christmas and I don't want to lose that, you know, the sweetness of the song, Amazing Grace and Silent Night. <laughs> but y'all need to understand that God came to earth. <laughs> right? Don't lessen what happened. <laughs> when we sing amazing away in the manger, or when we sing silent night, I want you to have images of your head of the USS Bainbridge coming to the rescue of one man who thought he was going to die. That's the equivalent of what happens. The one who came to our rescue was Emmanuel, God with us, <laughs> who has the power and the authority to call down angels from heaven for his purposes and his desires. The ancient one humbled himself to become fully man because we were hostages being held captive by sin. Christmas is the beginning of a rescue mission that was conceived and carried out by none other than God himself. So this Advent, prepare. <laughs> prepare for Jesus to be revealed in your life. Prepare knowing that he is preparing a place for you in heaven Allow him to chisel away at the hard spots in your heart. Prepare yourself for the plans that he has for you, for this church, for our community. Prepare for his kingdom to advance. Prepare for the lost to be found and for the blind to see. Prepare for his love to be made known to a hurting and dying world through you. Prepare for Jesus to return and claim his bride. You know, I speak to you guys, one of the rules of being a, a teacher, a speaker, is to know your audience, right? And I know you. <laughs> And I know that for the most part, I'm looking around in this room and I'm seeing disciples. I'm seeing blood-bought, water-washed children of the King. So the conversation I have with you is different than if I had a room full of seekers before me who didn't know Christ yet. Does that make sense? I lean into you a little bit harder. I push a little bit more <laughs> because you get it to varying degrees and that's fair 
our life's walk and our life's journey is a little bit different. But you have a responsibility as a child of the king to grow in your relationship with him, to prepare your hearts, to step out and do what he's called you to do. The moment you say yes to him, the moment you walk in baptism, guys, it is no longer about you. It becomes about him. It becomes about allowing him to make the changes in your heart to make you and morph you into something more that looks like him over time, more and more, right? It becomes about sharing the gospel, (laughs) about telling people what you have, about how beautiful it is and what he's done for you in your life and how that makes a difference. You have a responsibility. Guys, Emmanuel, God with us, God has come. (laughs) We've been rescued. And through his rescue, we've been brought home. We remember what happened on that first Christmas, which means it's already happened. We celebrate it. Our best response is to continue to prepare ourselves that the realization that all of he, all, everything that he has accomplished is an invitation for us to grow and develop and to be ready. Why? Because he's coming back. <laughs> Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for sending your son to rescue us from our sin in response to and in preparation for our certain home in heaven, we pray the prayer of David from Psalm 139, verse 23 through 24. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We will now prepare for communion. Aaron, if you want to come up and help me, I would appreciate that. Thank you. We celebrate communion because Jesus asked us to, (laughs) but what he asked us to do as we celebrate communion is to remember him. Remember what he did for us. Remember the example that he gave when he walked the earth. Remember the stories that are in the New Testament that were passed down from generations to generation. So when you come to this table, you come because God loves you He loved you first (laughs) and there is nothing in the world that can separate him from you. There is nothing about your life that you have to make worthy. The very thing that we celebrate this morning in communion is what makes you worthy, amen? On the night he was handed over, do you wanna take the bread up? Walk forward and tear it. Jesus had a meal with his friends. He took a loaf of bread after giving thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup. He held it up, showed it to his friends, and gave it to them. And they shared it around the table and he said, drink this, all of you. This is the cup of my blood, the blood that represents the new covenant that I make with you. This blood has been shed for you and for the forgiveness of your sins. So when you drink this, remember me. Amen. I'm gonna pray and your response is simply, Lord, we remember. 
God, we think about the love you have for us, so great that you would send your son to earth, divine and yet human, to live among us. Lord, we remember. Lord Jesus Christ, your life on earth is one that changed the course of history. Your time on earth still breathes life, centuries later, into our dry and thirsty souls. Lord, we remember. Lord Jesus, our Savior, your death seemed like victory for hell, that the enemy thought he could put you in the grave. Your journey to the cross, a path marked by tears and blood and the cries of those who love you. Lord, we remember. Lord Jesus, our resurrected King, in three days while the enemy was still celebrating, your tomb was discovered empty. You looked in the eyes of the enemy and you said, you lose. Lord, we remember. Lord Jesus, our new covenant, established by the breaking of your body and the shedding of your blood, written on our hearts for the transformation of the world, we wait for your return. Lord, we remember. I want you to remember and know that um, in our church here, you do not have to be a member of this church to partake in communion. We believe that this is God's table and that all are welcome, okay? Um, I'm gonna take the bread up, Aaron will take the communion, um, sit quietly and pray while Kayla is singing. Um, as you feel ready, come up and, and partake of it. We're gonna leave the offering baskets up front. Just bring your offering up and drop it in the basket as you come, okay? The table has been set, all are welcome. body of Christ broken for you. Body of Christ broken for you. Body of Christ broken for you. Body of Christ broken for you, Jenga. Body of Christ broken for you, Drew. Body of Christ broken for you, Elizabeth. Body of Christ broken for you, Stevie. Okay. I'm going to give you your communion, and then I want you to go up here and take that lighter and grab the candle, and right in the very front right there is your baptismal candle. And you go light that, and when you light that, I want you to tell the enemy, you lost. Okay?
throne was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe, for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, and the Spirit gospel truth of old shall not kneel shall not faint by his blood and in his name in his freedom I am free for the love of Jesus Christ who has resurrected me praise the Father praise the Pray with me, please. Father God, thank you. Thank you for all that you have done for us. Thank you for the way that you love us. Thank you for the opportunities you give us on a daily basis to grow nearer to you. Thank you for the way that you don't hold anything against us, that as your children, it is your blood that makes us worthy. Thank you for the gift of this holiday season and all that it represents the generosity of sharing gifts with others as you, you gave us your, by your example, the beauty of the lights and the festiveness of, of all of the decorations that transform even simple homes into something beautiful and peaceful. The opportunity to gather with friends and to celebrate a year of all of the stuff that you've done for us. Father, I pray for those quiet moments. I pray for moments early in the morning when we get up and turn on the Christmas lights and just sit in the silence and allow your spirit to soak into our hearts. I pray for those quiet moments when we stop and are still long enough to hear your voice calling us to pray for somebody, bringing a person to mind that maybe needs a phone call or a card or some a prayer or something father i pray that for those of us who enter into the holiday season with a sense of anxiety and foreboding about um, finances about health about relationships lord that we find your peace in those quiet moments and a trust that things will work themselves out a confidence that whatever comes that you stand beside us that we never face any of those things alone I pray for a deepening of those relationships with you I pray for this to be a holy and a sacred time of spiritual growth and preparation Lord your word promises that all who seek to find you will 
let it be so, Lord, let it be so. Will you join me in the prayer in your bulletins, please? Father God, every word in scripture points to the gift of hope that we have because of Christ Jesus. The Christmas story wasn't the beginning of that message of hope. The Old Testament is full of glimpses of your plan to redeem and restore your people. We are reminded of our hope in you that nothing is too difficult, too messy, or too dirty for you. You gave us the gift of hope wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Thank you, Father, for your immeasurable love. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Um, we will have a special announcement. M Megan would like to say something to the church, but we'll do that. Um, she's requested that we wait to do that till after the cameras are off. So we'll wait, wait, push that back just a little bit. Are there any other announcements? Angie, what should we be talking about as far as ministry for a mission work that we're going to doing for the holidays? Okay, so we have a Chris, yes, the Christmas tree in the back in the foyer. Um, there are, you can take an ornament off and it'll kind of tell you what need to get for the family that we're sponsoring and have those back here by December 14th. Okay, fantastic. Any other announcements that I'm missing, anything? Pardon me? Mm -hmm. The um, meal, we've got a senior meal coming up. Remember we, we used to do before COVID, we did those community meals. Um, we just like to network with the community, get to know people and share some of the gifts of our church and, and just love on people. And so we've got one planned on December 8th. It's a Thursday night. Um, Jan has secured the senior facility. We'll, um, the senior center will have it there. Um, we will need all hands on deck. I think um, we'll start serving um, by five o'clock. Um, so I know Kathy has said she'll be there probably around four, 4.30. If you can make it by four, 4.30 to help set up for all those who can get there that early, great. Um, we'll also need people at the tail end to help clean up and all of that sort of thing. So um, we will have a sign up sheet for desserts as well. So we'll get something created. Casey, would you make a note to get a sign up sheet and we'll pass that around next Sunday. Um, but everybody tends to jump in pretty easily on those. So anything else that I'm missing? Okay, please stand. Father God, I pray for holy divine moments this week. I pray for personal moments. I pray for those moments when we connect with you one-on-one -on -one and find your hope in Jesus' name, amen. Mighty.